Hello, everybody. Welcome. It is very nice to have you with us this afternoon. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And we are extremely pleased to see you here for our lecture this afternoon. I wanted to thank our co-sponsor, which is the Ford School's International Policy Center, and in particular, Alan Stamm, our new director for that center, for their support in both uh, planning the events for today, but also in co-sponsoring the lecture. Um, as those of you who are interested in international policy issues may know, there are a wide variety of new initiatives and activities that the IPC is um, sponsoring and initiating, and I hope that you will follow those and perhaps become involved in some of those as well. Um, Al, I'd also like to thank for helping to field questions in the afternoon discussion part of the session, along with one of our students, Andrew Ridgewell. So uh, we will get to that part later on in our session today. Today's event is our annual Citigroup Foundation Lecture. And this series is one that the school is particularly proud of because it enables us to bring some of the most impactful policy leaders to campus and to the Ford School to interact with um, our students and our faculty and to share their perspectives. It is also a personal pleasure for me to be able to welcome our speaker today. We are delighted to be hosting Helene Gale, who was, as many of you know, recently recognized by foreign policy as one of the world's top global thinkers. Um, Dr. Gale, of course, is the president and CEO of Care USA, which is one of the world's both largest and oldest humanitarian organizations, humanitarian aid organizations. And I encourage you to look at the longer bio of her that we have in our program. But you will see that she has held a number of key positions, both within the private sector and in public service. And just to highlight a couple of things, she directed the HIV, TB, and Reproductive Health Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and she chaired President Obama's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS. The impact of her work has been both global but also personal, and in so many places throughout the world where um, poverty and disease threaten lives, the work that the CARE organization does, and uh, Dr. Gale leads over 11,000 CARE employees um, to really move forward their unshakable commitment to improving the lives and to uh, strengthening human dignity throughout the world. So I am particularly pleased as well to recognize that she spent quite a bit of time talking to our undergraduates this, after, uh, this morning and a number of our graduate students this afternoon, as well as having a discussion with a number of faculty. Dr. Gale, we really enjoyed all of those conversations. We appreciate your time and your perspective, both in the small groups, but also look forward to hearing what you will be sharing with us this afternoon. So welcome to the Ford School and the University of Michigan. We have structured today's event as a conversation, and it will essentially be an interview with two of my Ford School colleagues and Dr. Gale. And so I would briefly like to introduce those two faculty colleagues to you. First, um, Professor Marina Whitman. Um, Marina is a renowned international economist who has a particular expertise on global corporate responsibility. She, among a number of other um, involvements in both the public and the private sector, served as a member of President Nixon's Council of Economic Advisors. And so we very much look forward to your part in the conversation. We are also delighted to have our faculty member, Sharon Messini, who will be joining us in the conversation as well. Sharon is a health economist and has taught courses at the Ford School in public health as well as in microeconomics. And so her research has centered on econometric evaluation of public health policies in developing countries. And Sharon, we're delighted that you were part of our conversation as well. Marina and Sharon have come up with a series of questions that we think reflect some of the most important challenges that confront both care and humanitarian aid more generally. We do want to make sure to leave time for questions from the audience, and so our staff will be collecting the cards, which we invite you to write your questions on at around 4.40. Um, 
And you can also tweet whether you are here in the room or you are watching us through the online streaming. And the hashtag is Policy Talk. So again, we invite your questions, whether through the handwritten card or through a tweet um, to the Policy Talks hashtag. And as I mentioned, um, Professor Al Stam will select questions along with our student, and I should have mentioned a former CEO intern, Andrew Ridgewell. So um, with no further ado, I am now extremely pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Gale and Marina Whitman and Sharon Massini. Well. Let me just echo again how really pleased we are to have you here and to have these many interactions that you've been having with our community. It's been a full day. Yeah, <laughs> I gather. Um, I'm quite sure that everyone in the room knows that CARE is a worldwide philanthropic organization, but partly because you, CARE's mandate is so broad I think that people would like to know, um, you know, how, how CARE started out and how its mission and its focus or foci have evolved over time. Great. Well, good. Thanks. And um, again, I, I just want to say how pleased I am to be here. It's been a really great day and um, not being somebody who is in the university setting on a daily basis, it's always wonderful to be among students and uh, faculty and people who are grappling with so many interesting issues. So I've, I've had a really great day and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So CARE, um, we've been around for about 70, almost 70 years. CARE started right after World War II. It started as a, actually a cooperative of a lot, several different NGOs that came together as part of the effort to rebuild Europe after World War II. So we started out by giving food and basic um, um, essentials to people in Europe uh, who had been devastated by that war. And um, a lot of people don't know that care packages actually derive from uh, our roots and our origins. We gave out care packages. And it was a, you know, it was, it, I, I spent a little time on the origins because I think it really speaks in many ways to our legacy as, as an organization. You know, it was an opportunity for Americans who um, at one point, you know, the day before were on one side of the equation and the next day were, were able to say, you know, the war is over, we forget that, and the people who, some of the countries that were our enemies today are our friends, it really saw this as a way of, of building peace. And so, you know, our real, real roots are using our um, outreach to communities around the world as, a, as not only just a way of providing basic resources and, and basic needs to people, but actually hopefully being part of a broader effort to build a more peaceful and stable world. Um, obviously, Europe was rebuilt, and um, CARE then used the organization um, to really start focusing on uh, helping communities around the world that were facing poverty more broadly. And a lot of our roots were in emergency relief and we continue to do emergency relief, but eventually emerged from and evolved from primarily focusing on short-term, immediate and emergent needs to really how can we work with poor communities around the world to um, do what we can to eliminate extreme poverty. So our focus really now is broadly working to, uh, in the effort to eliminate extreme poverty, working with the poorest communities around the world to build their capacity, and to also put in place the kinds of policies that support that. So we work very much on programs and the whole range of things that reflect people's basic needs, whether it's health, education, um, access to, to income and financial services, improving agricultural output, access to clean and safe drinking water, all the things that we know are so critical for people's basic survival. But how do you do that in a way that actually builds capacity along the way and also helps to look at the underlying issues of inequity, um, poor governance, lack of citizens' abilities to exercise their rights and doing this in a way that really 
hopefully creates long-term sustainable social change and not just short-term uh, fixes for immediate needs. So we try to work on both, as I think about it, the consequences of poverty, but also the underlying causes. Let me just say before we move on to the next question that um, I don't know how many of you have ever talked about sending a care package <laughs> to a child away from home or whatever. And that phrase comes from the fact, and I still remember my parents came here from Hungary before World War II, we sent care packages right. back to relatives in Europe after World War II. And just as Kleenex has come to stand right. for tissue, so a care package has come to stand for any package that is sent to someone or to people, uh, which includes things that they would find helpful, useful, enjoyable. So it's really entered our vocabulary. Right, right. Um, so uh, one of the focuses of uh, care that I'm particularly interested in is this sort of idea of um, empowering girls and women as a, as a way to kind of uh, encourage sustainable social change. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the sort of genesis of that, the reasoning behind that, um, maybe give a couple examples of how you operationalize that on the ground in particular programs? Yeah, it's a good point. You know, in our mission to eliminate extreme poverty over the years, you know, we really have increasingly put a focus on empowering girls and women. And so, you know, if you read our literature, we will talk about how, um, how important it is to make sure that we have that, that focus on, on, on girls and women throughout our work. Two reasons. First of all, um, girls and women bear the greatest brunt of poverty. And so if you look at the people who have least access to education, you know, two thirds of those who are illiterate are, are women or two thirds of uh, children who don't have access to school or don't complete school are girls. If you look at health indices uh, and the unacceptable rates of maternal mortality, for instance, or the fact that girls are less likely to get access to health services when they're sick, et cetera. So if you look at you know, any, any measure uh, income, you know, women work uh, most of the work hours but get only 10% of world income. Uh, do more than 50% of agricultural productivity, but er, own only 1% of the farmland, whatever, whatever. You can keep looking at the statistics, but clearly um, girls and women bear the brunt of poverty around the world and make up over 60% of those who live in extreme poverty, less than a dollar, dollar 25 a day. Flip side of that is that if you have an impact uh, on the life of a girl or woman, you have an impact that is really catalytic and you really are able to make uh, intergenerational change. So a girl who is educated, more likely to marry later, have fewer children, send her children to school, and you can really create that virtuous cycle of change. So we know that if you can have an impact on the life of a girl or woman, she will put that into her family, her family's outcome will, will uh, change, and you know, ultimately, you bring greater benefits for whole societies because you can't keep 50% of a population behind and expect that that same population is going to have the same progress. I was just in um, Benin, West Africa, a couple of weeks ago, talking to the president, and he was saying, you know, how how for him this issue of of empowering girls and women. <coughs> Um, just makes sense because he recognizes as a country that is living in extreme poverty, if you're keeping back 50% of those who could be productive, you're not helping the whole society. So any way you slice it, numerically, or if you look at what happens when you change the life of a girl or woman, you have a huge impact on families. And you know, one of the programs that we put a lot of focus on is um, micro savings and lending. And we have a program that uh, really help women pool resources together, save resources so that they can then make small loans that help them start businesses. And you, know, you will hear over and over what a $2 loan can do for a woman who then is able to start a business, now has the ability to access clean water, so 
send her children to school. The children don't get diarrheal diseases, so they stay in school and finish school. Uh, she has an income that allows them to, um, as a family, have a greater outcome. Her husband respects her more because she's no longer a burden. She's actually contributing. It decreases gender-based violence. So there's this whole cycle of change that happens um, as you put this focus on, on girls and women. And we know even in our own uh, in our own society now, there's evidence that you know, and you probably know this from your corporate board uh, engagement. You know, if you have uh, three or more women on a board, the outcome of that uh, corporation is improved, and that's you know their profit indices. So we know that this value of including women, whether it's in poor communities or in our own country, has this this impact that that um, you know has been far too long not utilized. I mean, um, there's clearly an infinite portfolio of problems and issues you care could tackle. How does CARE select the programs and the projects that it will, in fact, uh, engage in? And also, how does it deal with the unintended consequences that are bound to accompany any uh, project? Well, yeah, um, you know, for any organization that lives off of other people's money, <laughs> there is always a dance between what resources are available and what the greatest needs are. And I think we try to make sure that we're doing as much as we can to harmonize those. So when, it, when we work in a country, and we're in over 80 countries around the world, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, Middle East, et cetera, and so, you know, and we've had um, longstanding roots in most of the countries in which we work. So we've been there for decades, and oftentimes we'll come into a country because of an emergency, but then stay long term so that we're really helping to build capacity and build past just that emergency situation, but look at how do we develop long term sustainable change. In that, we work with communities to look at what are their greatest needs, what are their highest priorities, where are their other organizations, and then look at where are their resources and how do we put those together. But it really is by trying to make sure that we're doing what makes the greatest difference for those communities and that there's real engagement in those communities uh, around the programs in which we work. Oftentimes that means a, you know, a somewhat long process and, and, uh, and sometimes you know, the work takes a while to get to that point, but it means if we are able to get communities um, engaged and really feel ownership of the programs and the priorities, then they're gonna have a much longer term impact than if we're coming in with some cookie cutter approach and saying, you know, here are the programs we wanna do. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's how we try to work. And, you know, again, it's a dance between what resources are available and where the needs are greatest, how do you put those together, and hopefully do that in a way that really um, can have the greatest impact. And the other half was how do you try to minimize the unintended consequences that come out of any uh, project that brings about any kind of change? Yeah, it's a good, you know, it's a good question. And, um, you know, back to, uh, to the point about um, empowering girls and women, one of the que questions I get asked all the time is, so what happens to the men and boys if you're focused on <laughs> girls and women? And, you know, we believe strongly that if, that empowerment of girls and women can't happen if you're not also having change occur in boys and men because you can't change the way women feel about themselves and, and then have them back in a situation where men and boys' ideas about women haven't changed. So I think the way we try to have minimize unintended consequences of any change is working on both sides, making sure that as we're as we're empowering communities, we're also working with governments to recognize their responsibility. So you can't keep teach citizens their rights without helping to make sure that governments understand their responsibility. So I think we try to make sure that whatever we're doing on one side, we're also working on the other side of the equation so that as progress uh, occurs, it's happening together. Um. So um, you've mentioned that CARE invests in sort of a bunch of health-specific programs and then also a bunch of economic programs like microfinance programs. Um, 
And I'm just wondering if you can comment on um, the sort of the lots of evidence on the dual relationship between health and wealth and the sort of two-way link between those two. And it seems to, that seems to complement um, your sort of dual focus as well. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think we try to look at less about our, um, think of our work less in terms of sectors, health and economic development or water or agriculture, and more looking at how do you have a comprehensive whole that allows communities to develop. So, you know, we might have a program that starts with microfinance, but then links that to um, being able to access health services so that as people are able to develop income streams, pooling those together. For instance, I was in a program not too long ago where the village savings and loan program, that's our microfinance savings program, village savings program, also, while they make loans to individuals, they also pool resources so that they have the ability to send women to the hospital when they um, are in labor, and if they have a complicated pregnancy, they aren't stuck in the village without a way, a means of transport to the regional health center. So we really look at holistically, how do you make sure that we're building on programs so that it's not just a project at a time, but really looking what, what, is it, what are the comprehensive needs of a community? How are we gonna have an overall long-term impact and not looking at it as health or economic development, but it's really community development. And what are the things that you need to do that really make that a comprehensive picture and not a sector-focused program? One thing that one hears from a number of development expert, experts is the importance of a rigorous evaluation process for projects in order to allocate funds efficiently. And, um, how do you decide how much of your funding should go into the, such an evaluation process as opposed to actually funding right. programs? Well, again, you know, some of that is dictated by donors and funders themselves. And for many programs that, we're, that we have, there is a certain amount that's allocated for, for program evaluation. And I think evaluating individual programs is oftentimes not as much of a challenge as really being able to look longer term at what kind of impact you're having. Because funding of impact, impact first of all, impact measurement is difficult. Yep. Um, looking at how are you having an impact on something as complex as poverty is not simple. Secondly, you know, again, I think there, while a lot of donors want impact um, measurement, there aren't a lot of donors who are funding impact. And so I think, you know, for us, we've tried to look at how do you take the resources that you have and put together different pieces uh, of information that will give you some understanding of the kind of impact that you're having, more than just short-term projects. Because again, I think, you know, for so long the aid industry was um, based on being able to do projects that you're paid for by a donor that provides short-term success after two or three years, but it's not looking at long-term, are you actually creating change? That's a lot more difficult to do, and it's also a lot more difficult to measure. We, like so many other organizations, are just grappling with that, are really trying to look at how do you get some proxy measures for, for what will really uh, end up being long-term, um, true long-term impact. We'd love to do something with, with the, um, the Ford School on impact measurement. <laughs> so, you know, it's a good area. I, you know, I think it, it is a, a very much an evolving area. Um, so switching gears a bit, um, there's uh, been increasing involvement of, of PPPs, these sort of public-private partnerships, particularly in global health, are the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, but I'm wondering, this had come up earlier in some of our sessions of sort of thinking about ways that the public sector and private sector can kind of coordinate and, um, and be very useful uh, in terms of various aid projects. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that in the context of um, the ways in which CARE works with the private sector. And, um, those yeah, no, projects. I think it's actually a very hopeful trend that um, has happened a lot recently. You know, I think there was a time when, um, you know, there was the public sector and the private sector and 
uh, neither, the, the two never met in between. And I think nowadays, the distinction between what's public and private is blurring a little bit more. I think you know, there's a lot more that we're learning as a, you know, as a um, not-for-profit from the for-profit world. I think there's a lot more that for-profits are, are learning and taking away from uh, the way not-for-profits work. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for much greater collaboration. We've really, um, in the last few years, developed some very, very strong partnerships, particularly with uh, some of the large multinational corporations. They recognize that the very communities that we work with are going to be their future markets. So there's a business incentive. They also realize that from a social good perspective, they have a lot to offer as well. So you know, I was giving an example earlier of a project that we're involved with with um, um, uh, General Mills, I was thinking of uh, yeah. GM, your yeah, GM, <laughs> uh, General Mills, uh, who recently bought haagen Well, we're working with them in Madagascar, which um, supplies 80% of the world's vanilla to incorporate poor, the poor small farmers into their global supply chain for vanilla that will end up one day on your grocery store um, shelf as haagen vanilla ice cream. So we're working with poor farmers, helping them to increase their agricultural productivity, um, better crop, higher quality, also helping them to have greater access to uh, a larger part of the, the uh, supply chain so they're actually learning how to do some of the production because a lot of the poor farmers uh, would, would grow vanilla bean and then sell it to the, to the processors. And the processing part is actually the more lucrative part of the, of the supply chain. So we're now helping them to be, to be more productive, have a greater um, portion of the supply chain it helps haagen and General Mills because they have a better, a more sustainable, less expensive, de dependable uh, supply of vanilla. It helps poor farmers in that country. So it can be a really huge economic um, engine. And it's not like a grant that after two or three years, the grant runs out, the project stops. This is something that's long-term and sustainable. Uh, we have a, another great project, I think I was talking about it earlier, that I visited uh, earlier this year in Egypt, or last year, um, and it's with Danone, the milk and yogurt uh, company. And it's a project that takes you know, women who may have one cow, um, you know, poor women who have a, a shack, a couple of children, and a cow, and that cow, they're taught what are the ways to increase the, the milk yield of the cow? They, they take it to a community collection center. That community collection center has, you know, was outfitted with all the clean, hygienic techniques. And that becomes part of their supply chain for, um, for, um, for, that, for uh, Egypt, for the country. That was a project that started out a couple of years ago. And it started out producing about 4% of the nation's, um, uh, of the Danone um, needs. It went to about 15% in six months, and now they think that before long it's gonna produ be producing 60% of all of their national needs for, um, for the company. Huge income stream, it's a dependable income stream for those women, um, and it's a great uh, local source of uh, milk supply. So those are the kinds of projects that you know, are really encouraging to see where mm -hmm. the private sector and the social sector, if you will, are collaborating in ways that we couldn't have done before. You've mentioned several times um, the importance and sometimes the difficulty of bringing together needs and donors' wishes. So sort of what percentage, what proportion of all the money you get is unrestricted and, and the other side of it, how much of it is restricted to specific purposes? Yeah, so most of our funding is restricted. Um, and about 10% is unrestricted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you know, our, our funding, and we've, we've really shifted our funding a lot over the last few years. So we, uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, 70 to 80% of our funding would have come from the US government, from USAID. 
Um, and then most of the rest of it would have come from individual donors. Now about 30% of our funding comes from USAID, um, another 25 to 30% from other uh, governments like the DFID, the UK, the European Union, and some of our members, countries from, uh, from uh, European and other donor nations, Australia, Canada, et cetera. Then the rest is from corporations, foundations, and individuals. Individual contributions are what makes up most of our unrestricted mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, that tends to be you know, small donors, people who give 10, 20, 25 dollars, what have you. Um, but the rest of it is the restricted funding that comes from larger institutional donors. So it's a challenge, and it's a, a, anybody, you know, it's the same that universities have, the same sort of challenge. People will give you funding for specific projects, but not to support your infrastructure. And I think it's very short-sighted, because ultimately, it's that having, maintaining that infrastructure and that platform to be able to do the programs, if that's not strong and if that's not sound, ultimately, we're not going to be able to deliver on doing good projects. Um, so you've mentioned um, so far a couple of times the importance of long-term sustainability. Um, and I imagine a, a big piece of that is sort of partnership with local governments as well as other NGOs that are on the ground. Um, and I also know you've, you've mentioned before, I'm not sure if in this conversation or in earlier conversations, but that a lot of your employees uh, in the countries where you work are local to the area. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can just talk about how all of those different factors work in terms of long-term sustainability of the projects that is sort of is an important mission for CARE? Yeah, well, yeah, as you mentioned, most of our staff, and there, we're about 10,000 plus people around the world, most of our staff come from the countries in which we work. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go to Ethiopia, most of our staff would be Ethiopian. If you go to Peru, most of them would be Peruvian, et cetera. So you know, our staff um, are local. They reflect the cultures and the communities in which we work. And we think that's very important. That's a huge shift too. I, you know, 20 years ago, most of our staff would have been, you know, European or American. But we've really shifted to make sure that we really are in, in increasing, increasingly focusing on building the capacity of the countries in which we work, being relevant, uh, making sure that we, you know, that we have people who understand the cultures in which we work. Yeah, I think the the, the challenge of long-term sustainability is both. Um, you know, being, making a long-term commitment to a country, having staff and working with the community so that they feel real ownership of, of programs. But it is also how do you find the resources and looking more for being able to get flexible, unrestricted resources so that you can have longer term and not so project uh, and project related uh, work. So, you know, I think that's, that is key. Um, and it's always a challenge for an organization like ours to be able to have long-term funding. And again, it's why some of the work with the private sector and creating longer-term sustainable um, projects that, that are based on actually generating income, I think offers a lot of opportunity. We now have a part of CARE that, you know, we're a 501c3, a not-for-profit, our, our main organization, but we've now developed an organization that's actually a for-profit arm of care so that we can actually do income generating um, activities that hopefully will lead to new revenue streams that will allow us to have that kind of long-term and more sustainable way of working. Looking back over the last 10 years or so, what's your assessment of the successes and the disappointments of the Millennium Development Goals, and also looking forward and taking account of the fact that the economic recession and upheavals of the last few years have cut into economic aid, uh, how, how hopeful are you about the achievement of the 2015 Goals? Well, I think there's a lot of progress that has been made in the Millennium Development Goals. And you know, I'm sure most people here know um, back in 2000, we, uh, the world, through the leadership of UN and at that time uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan, put in place the Millennium Development Goals with the goals 
um, of having poverty by 2015, access to education, um, and some health goals around HIV and malaria and TB, maternal health, uh, et cetera. And so the whole set of, uh, I think it's primarily eight core Millennium Development Goals. And you know, the, the, the uh, progress is mixed. Um, you know, in some parts of the world, uh, particularly in um, countries that are now middle income countries, there's been huge reduction in poverty. There have been, there's been a lot of progress in the education goal. Uh, there's been, you know, progress in the water, in some of the water goals. There's been progress, considerable progress in some of the health goals, but it varies a lot. And, and if you look region by region, it's been incredibly variable. There's a big push now um, starting April 6th um, to count down to the last thousand days with renewed vigor uh, on part of the world community to really see what can we do in the last thousand days to see if we can push towards that, but also with the recognition that we're not going to achieve all of the Millennium Development Goals. And what's the add-on? What, how do we, what should we be doing post-2015 to look at both making sure that we finish the job that we started and not say, okay, let's have a whole new set of goals and forget that we didn't accomplish all the, the others. Let's have a, a new set of goals. Let's, let's make sure that we're incorporating the things that we didn't finish, but also look at how the world has changed. And the world has changed. Um, you know, the issue of climate change, for instance, is one that wasn't part of the um, previous Millennium Development Goals, and people really feel, and, and the current Secretary General particularly, that we need to look at climate change, goals towards um, continu continuing to reduce the impact of climate change, but also continuing to re reduce the factors that lead to it, looking much more at the issue of equitable growth, because you know now uh, more poor people live in middle-income countries than in the poorest of the poor countries. So that means while overall economic conditions may be improving in many countries, inequity is becoming more of a problem within countries where, where their actual um, you know, kind of uh, overall national economic picture has increased. So looking at this notion of, of equity more as a lens as well as absolute poverty. So there are a lot of those sort of things that I think will, will be part of the dialogue in looking at what's the follow-on, the add-on to uh, 2015. And a lot, of, uh, you know, a lot of discussion. I think the, the, um, the add-on to post-2015 will be probably a more inclusive process because the Millennium Development Goals before were uh, developed kind of quickly. Um, so I think that, you know, in the next year or so, moving into 2015, there's a lot of discussion around what should these goals look like and, and making sure that they are inclusive and um, create a, a, a strong dialogue around them. But I think the Millennium Development Goals have been incredibly useful because we had some goals. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, part of what we have lacked before around these issues is not having targets to actually shoot for. And so having those goals, I think, have, has been a huge mobilizer of resources. And I think there's been such focus on it, such commitment, that even in the wake of some of the economic downturn, you know, there still is a strong commitment to try to see what we can do to, to reach those goals. So I think it's about time now to shift to questions from the audience. I think this is on. Yep, it's on. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Andrew Ridgway. I'm a second year MPP and I was an intern at CARE uh, this summer and I'm still actually working part-time uh, for CARE. And Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I am looking for a job, so. <laughs> so uh, let's begin with the student questions. Uh, could you describe a specific program that you were especially inspired by or excited about? Um, well, I named a couple, uh, you know, uh, the, the, this uh, one that I often give this example of uh, the, the project in Egypt, the Danone project, which is, uh, you know, I think really spectacular when you literally go to a one room shack and see a woman with her cow and realize that that cow is producing milk that is going to be on uh, the grocery store shelf 
uh, in, in that country. So some of those, I, I, I think, are, are, are really incredible. What, but one of the ones that I really, um, that, that I have just seen create incredible change for people is our village savings and loans program. And it's a, pretty, it's a really simple program. It started in um, Niger, West, Air, uh, West Africa, uh, about 20 years ago. And it really kind of built on a community savings sort of approach, where as opposed to a lot of the microfinance um, programs, which started with credit, where you went and took out a loan um, from an institution, this really started by first saving one's assets. And you know, when I think about it simplistically, most of us didn't start our banking life by taking out a loan. We started by putting pennies in a piggy bank. And it got us familiar with money with savings and first developing our own assets. So it's built on that, that, that approach. And it's sometimes people taking what amounts to a few pennies and collecting that. But it's giving people management skills along the way. And it's often, you know, uh, probably 70% of our village savings and loans programs are um, women and women who didn't have economic power within their family. And so they, they, they save, they put the money together, they save, they make up, um, uh, the, the groups usually are about 10 or 15 people, they make up their rules, how much interest they're going to um, charge for loans, what the repayment schedules are gonna be, and all the rest of this. And then we give them management training, what businesses should they go into, how can they use their resources most effectively, uh, how can it be used for, for community-wide um, benefit as well? And so looking at what that small amount of money can do to change the lives of, of um, families. And I give an example of one woman who actually came to a conference that we have every year in Washington, a woman from Burundi in Central Africa. Never been out of the country, had never been out of, never been out of Africa, uh, came and spoke at this, at this uh, conference that we have, and she told her story of how you know, she started out with a $2 loan, and how that loan, she was able to start a business. From that business, she then was able to develop a, a store, and she became a merchant within her community. And just the ripple effects that that had for her family, as she, as a woman who had basically been a prisoner in her own home, been a victim of, of domestic abuse, um, and how it totally changed her whole life and the life of her family around because of a $2 loan that she was able to then use to start a business, develop a shop, send her children to school, totally changed the dynamic of her and her her husband who you know again did used to beat literally beat her saw her as now you know this is this is somebody who has some value they became real partners and then she talks about you know just how different her relationship with her husband was who you know now saw her as an equal partner and they talked about their their children's life and their future together so it's you know these things that as small and as simple as they may seem, can really start a whole ripple effect of change. And we see that over and over again of how these simple things can make such a huge difference in people's lives. Uh, next question. How does CARE work with governments that are not as transparent and or struggling with corruption? <laughs> what are the difficulties and how has CARE tried to overcome them? What effect do these type of situations or partnerships have on long-term sustainability? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, first of all, as a non-governmental organization, we're not obliged to work with governments or work directly with governments. Our work is um, largely through other NGOs on the ground. We do a lot of work uh, implementing our programs with uh, local and national NGOs, and so, as far as the transparency of our resources, that's within our, you know, essentially within our own management structures and our own control because we work with, with organizations, we work with our money, we don't give money directly to the government. That said, um, because of the challenges in governments that are corrupt or that are unstable, um, you know, we're always working with government, we're often working with governments where um, you know, there isn't, there isn't transparency, There's, there may not be capacity within, within government and government structures. And governments are often our partners, even though we don't work 
we don't work directly through governments. You know, the, the issue of um, corruption in places that we work is as much a, uh, an issue for the governments, but also just the cultures in which we work, where transparency and corruption it can be a huge problem. So we, even within our own staff, often have issues related to um, corruption, transparency, and it's, it's one of the things that we work with constantly to make sure that our management and our, our management structures and the, um, uh, the um, standards in which we hold our staff to are standards of, you know, that are of transparency and no tolerance for, for corruption. But it's a, you know, it is an issue throughout, and the instability of governments does mean that um, oftentimes we're in situations, I gave the example earlier of Mali, for instance, where um, we have had to shut down our operations in northern Mali because of the instability there, um, you know, or, Somalia, um, Sudan, you know, lots of places, Pakistan, Afghanistan. We had to close our country office in Iraq because our country office director was kidnapped and killed. So we, we work in, you know, very unstable situations throughout the world where, where the safe, safety of our staff and security has to constantly be an issue that's on our minds. From your perspective as CEO of CARE, how can the United States be a role model for women and girls abroad? And where is the U.S. behind on this issue? Well, um, you know, I think the fact that um, if you look around the world, um, the United States is behind in, in, in many measures. So, you know, I think about 16% of our Congress um, are women. And in many countries around the world, they have mandated that 30 to 50% of parliaments or cabinet positions have to be women. Uh, you take a country like Rwanda, for instance, you know, because there's a clear correlation between percent of women in government and peace and stability, there are a lot of post-conflict countries that have actually moved to mandate that, in fact, a certain percentage of their top government leadership actually needs to be women. So Rwanda has a higher proportion of their Senate, their, their parliament um, that are women than, than um, and their cabinet that uh, are women than the United States. So I think there's a, you know, there's a lot that we could learn from many countries around the world in terms of how do we get better representation of women in, in key policy um, positions. We know that governments that have more women in leadership, in policy leadership positions, have less corruption, um, have more stability, have uh, greater indicators, uh, you know, on all range of, of societal factors. So it's something where I think we do need to um, look at how could we do a better job. You know, the fact that we've never had a woman president. And you know, if you look around, you know, developed and developing worlds, you know, this is something that now is is kind of commonplace, where we're still grappling over, you know, is it time yet to have a woman president? So, I, you know, I think there are a lot of ways in which the United States could take a page from many developing countries as well as many developed countries around greater inclusion of women in in policy levels. And you know, there's a lot of talk about this these days with everything from Sheryl Sandberg's book on Lean In to um, Anne Marie Slaughter's Can You Have It All article. But I think these issues here in this country, I think there really is a, a revitalization of some of these issues around women and women leadership. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot to be learned from the rest of the world. How does CARE balance the tension between alleviating poverty now and threats to the environment and other sustainability, sustainability challenges? Yeah, well, we take, you know, the, this issue of, of sustainable development is something that's very, very important for us. And, um, we're really doing a lot of work with our sister organizations, environmental organizations, to look at how do you de do po um, development work in a way that also looks at sustaining the environment, and looking at projects where, uh, because many of the many of the communities in which we work in are the same communities that are most affected by climate change, environmental degradation, and so you know we really believe that you have to. It has to be hand in hand. It can't be development or, or um, 
the environment. It has to be the two hand in hand and looking at how do you come together with sustainable solutions for the environment, but also looking at long-term um, develop, income development and economic development and, and making sure that what we do doesn't have a, a, um, a detrimental impact uh, on the environment and, and the climate. So. How has CARE shifted towards or supported aid models that increase country ownership? And if you could, please speak specifically to Liberia's health sector pool fund. I don't know anything about Liberia's health sector pool fund. What was the first part of it? Uh, how has CARE shifted towards or supported aid models that increase country ownership? Yeah, well, you know, the whole issue of country ownership is, is the way, you know, the way we feel we have to work. So, um, you know, our, our, we, we look at our work as how do we work ourselves out of a job over the next, you know, 10, 20, however many years, but really looking, how do you develop ownership by the country? How do you make sure that um, we're building capacity? So most of our work today is not done um, by care. It is done in partnership with local organizations whose capacity we work to build and working alongside of communities to make sure that whatever we do builds long-lasting uh, capacity in those communities versus care doing the work. So it's just the way that we work. And you know, building local capacity and, and country ownership um, you know, is just part and parcel of you know, our fabric and the way that we work. You know, I give an example of um, uh, in, in Afghanistan, um, about a year or so ago, there were a lot of burnings of schools, and particularly schools that educated girls. Uh, CARES pro schools were the only schools that weren't burned down because they had been, or, or one of the few organizations who didn't have any of their schools burned down because we had been working with those communities for so long that they felt that those were their schools. They didn't feel like they were schools that were imposed on them by somebody outside. They felt that those were in fact their schools. They had ownership over them. So while a lot of other schools were actually um, burned down in the communities, ours were the ones that were able to be um, sustained. What, if any, kind of resistance to assistance has CARE seen in its work, uh, i.e. a local dominant business class, uh, pushback from local authorities, cultural ministries, et cetera? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. Maybe whoever answered that, asked that might. Um, you, yeah. yeah, no, I was really wanting to know about um, any kind of pushback you received from like, trying to help on the ground, but then maybe different uh, groups had interest that would be against what you're trying to do. So like, for example, in Madagascar, you mentioned that um, you had the process that cut out like, what, what seems to be like a middle man group that would treat the vanilla beans. Would you ever get a situation where that group of people were upset with the work you were doing and maybe try to um, grow another operation or something? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. You know, because I do think, you know, when you look at what we're trying to do, which is change the status quo, it does mean that you are in some ways threatening some people's interest. And, you know, I, I, I can't say that situation particularly because it's, it's new, it's evolving. But we have had situations where um, because you are in fact changing the status quo, um, you know, people's interests are threatened and sometimes we have been threatened. Um, you know, again, although it sounds somewhat simplistic and repetitive, I think the way that we've tried to do that is making sure that we are looking at how do we help um, mitigate that by working with all the groups that are involved. How do you make sure that everybody feels like they have a stake in poor people winning? How do you make sure that others understand how they can shift what they're doing so that they actually have benefit from it as well? And looking at making, if, if in fact the middle person is cut out of the situation, how will they also have gain from that because we can give them training to actually allow them to develop some other skills that they may not have had. So really looking at the whole system and how are you making sure that if you have change in one sector, 
that you're looking at what the consequences might be so that you can, in fact, mitigate that. So we try to look at the whole system and look at what might be the consequences and how can you bring everybody into it so that there's solutions that can be found more broadly and not just um, you know, looking at, at one piece of the puzzle. Are there corporate relationships that have not fared as well as hoped at the outset? And what have you learned from these experiences? Well, I think the, the, the corporate um, partnerships that haven't worked well are when there hasn't been an open, honest dialogue from the very beginning where the goals weren't clear, where the objectives weren't clear, and where you really didn't have shared value. And I think it's real, and, and shared objectives. I think it's really important, just like any partnership, that from the very beginning you're really clear and transparent about what each side wants from it, and that the, the, the objectives are clear and the game plan is clear. So we've had situations where, for instance, we might have a corporation or uh, an organization that uh, provides money for one purpose, and, and we may think, OK, well, they asked for uh, what they said they want to give us money for is to do Project X, but what we really want to do is Project Y. Let's see if we can't morph it into what we really want to do. Well, that never works uh, because it's not transparent. You didn't have the same goals. And unless you're really starting um, from something where you really um, you know, know what you both want to get out of it, in the end, it's, it's going to be disastrous. We've also had problems with corporations, particularly. And in some co corporations, um, the extractive industry is a good example, um, the oil and gas sector and uh, the mineral sector, where oftentimes there's real challenges because the very nature of their work destroys the environment, oftentimes is not as transparent in how the funds are being used. Um, there's huge. Uh, possibilities for corruption. And so, you know, there are sectors that are much more challenging to work with where we have had a real struggle in making sure that, you know, we're maintaining our values and um, making sure that the needs of the community that we're working with are being upheld. And we have had to, to in some cases, actually um, dissolve partnerships. But I think it's really by being as clear as possible from the very beginning, what are your priorities, what are your goals, making sure that we're being as transparent as possible and as any partnership, um, knowing when um, you know, uh, what you want out of it doesn't align and agreeing to disagree and move on. So can you tell us about CARE's role in combating the spread of tuberculosis worldwide? Are current measures sufficient to address the spread of drug-resistant TB? Yeah, TB is not a big focus of CARE's. Um, um, so it's, you know, it's, it's something from my previous lives that I've worked a lot with, but it is not a big focus of, of the work uh, of care. You know, I don't think that currently um, we have enough to treat drug-resistant tuberculosis, but it, it just frankly isn't something that I'm as involved in right now. In terms of the microfinance uh, slash community savings approach, I have noticed, especially with Kiva and other lending organizations, women are more likely to be trusted with loans. Does this observation apply in other aid situations? Are women more likely to receive aid over men and make better use of limited resources? Yeah, all the um, you know, data on, on lending programs have shown that women have been uh, incredibly good at repaying loans. And you know, most of the data suggests that uh, women with loans will repay um, you know, 96 plus uh, percent successfully. That said, you know, there's starting to be more evidence that also suggests that, often, that, that more often than um, was previously realized that sometimes women are taking out those loans for men and men are then coercing women to repay those loans. Um, and of, oftentimes coercing in, in sometimes violent ways. So I think you know, there's a lot more evidence behind some of those statistics, but I think overall um, studies have shown that women have very, very high repayment rates. But I think we're starting to, to look underneath that and looking at you know, repayment rates are not the only measure. I mean, what's happening to the loans? How are those loans being used? Are they being used in ways that actually help to empower women or not? Is there coercion? 
um, as a part of that. Are women actually being able to use the loans in ways that benefit her and her children versus being used as a, as a loan because so many of the loan programs are more um, uh, available for women than men, and men are actually using them. So there's a lot more to that than I, um, that I think is becoming um, you know, coming to light. But um, overall, yes, I, you know, there's been a lot of studies that show that women are very, very successful in, in loan repayment. What are some of the challenges with changing traditional cultural values and having long-term change in communities that Carrie has encountered, and how have they been managed? Sorry. The challenges with challenging traditional cultural values and um, getting them to change over the long-term in communities that Kara has worked with. Yeah, and I'm not sure who, if somebody who, who's there who asked that, if they want to elaborate on a little bit more what exactly they were trying to get at, or any specific. <coughs> Um, so having long-term cultural change for uh, long-term economic change for communities, and the fact that some communities have a cultural perception which maybe won't, won't go along with that, like like you just uh, mentioned, uh, empowering women, but then having uh, uh, cultures where maybe men coerce women or men you know, use women. Yeah. So I think. Um you know, what, what we've tried to do in, in our work is to make sure, again, that in working with communities, that we're not just doing programs, but we're also looking at how do you shift community norms, community standards, the way that people think about, uh, about um, change. You know, again, a good example is girls' education. In many places around the world, girls are not it's not seen as a good investment to send your girl to your daughter to school uh, as opposed to your son because girls are expected to marry early, have children, and education not seen as a benefit. We've been most successful in increasing enrollment for girls in school when the communities themselves have been educated, where, where fathers um, really buy into the notion that if their daughter has an education, She'll be more productive. She'll be able to have fewer children. Her life will be better. Um, and so I think it's, it really is by working with communities to understand the benefit that you can have that kind of cultural change. Um, I was just in, um, I mentioned I was in Benin, West Africa not long ago, a couple weeks ago. And we were working um, with a program that looked at land tenure for women. And a law had been passed not very recently that allowed women to own land. In many places around the world, as you know, women don't have the right to own land. They had recently passed a law, but the law was not really being enforced because there wasn't really strong community buy-in. In that program, we had paralegals, people who you know, weren't lawyers, but you know, kind of legal extenders, who actually worked with communities to start sensitizing them around the value of women having land ownership, giving tangible examples of women in their community who owned land um, and were able to um, increase their um, agricultural productivity, because it's a very agricultural country. And showing the value of that was able to start shifting the thinking about land ownership and land tenure and inheritance rights and some of the things that were new but it was by working with those communities that, that, in fact, that started shifting the cultural norms. And so, you know, it's always this, this mix between how do you help to, an individual, but then how do you help the society around that individual so that, in fact, um, that change takes place and you don't have an individual who's changed, but not a society that, that has changed along with them. Some argue that technology is the way to solve many or perhaps even most development challenges. Do you agree? Uh, can you give examples where technology has helped and also where it may have gotten in the way of what you're trying to do? Yeah, I think technology is a huge enabler and you know, has, has huge benefit for um, some of the development challenges we face. 
Um, so the mobile phone, mobile phone technology has had a huge impact. We do a lot of work with mobile banking now. So people who live in remote rural areas who never would have had access to, to, to banking, who used to only have the ability to have small transactions, who now are able to actually have um, you know, interaction with financial institutions. Our health work has been hugely impacted by the ability for people who are, again, in remote rural areas to be able to use SMS um, to either get information or to send symptoms so that health people who are in rural, rural areas um, and village health workers are able to communicate with higher levels of, um, of health services and really save lives in a lot of ways. So there's, there are a lot of ways. Um, the advent of new clean cook stoves that have really been developed that help to cut down on both the environmental degradation that goes along with chopping down trees for, for fuel, but also that uh, helps decrease the environmental pollution that leads to pneumonias in children, fire accidents, et cetera. So I think there, you know, those are just a few examples. Access to clean, safe drinking water. There are a lot of new technologies, both for um, sanitizing and, um, and making uh, drinkable water uh, that people can put. Uh, we, ha we have a project with Procter & Gamble. They have a, a substance, a pure packet that you can put into water and you know, change dirty water to clean right in front of your eyes or new, new um, filtration um, techniques and machines that are being used. So there's lots of ways in which I think technology has been hugely useful. But there are always limits. And we had a really good discussion of, of, of that earlier today around some of the limits of technology and where technology, where the people who create some of these solutions are not close enough to the problems to be creating solutions that are actually um, useful for, for, the, for the people who um, are trying to have an impact on their lives. Again, with clean cook stoves, some of the very early versions of those were done by people who weren't talking to the women who needed to use them. And they, they created cook stoves that once um, they were tried to be, once they were brought into villages and women tried to use them, they, they didn't even meet the needs of the very women that they were trying to serve. So I think, you know, if we're not linking technology and technological solutions with the people who actually need to use them, then we often can create in a vacuum things that don't have the real usefulness that they should. So, you know, I think technology has huge impact uh, and, and has had a huge potential, but it also needs to be done in a way that looks at the actual needs of the people and making sure that people are part of um, helping to design some of those solutions. So we have one last question. Uh, you have a very interesting background. Can you share a bit about how you got to CARES presidency from your initial career path in pediatrics? Um, yeah, well, I, you know, I started out as, um, as a clinical doctor in pediatrics. But I went into medicine because I wanted medicine as a way of contributing to positive social change. So I always had in, in my mind that I wanted a, a career that would allow me to have as great an impact on the largest number of people that I could in the most meaningful way. So that's a big goal. Um, so, but I started with pediatrics and then migrated to public health because it was a way of not looking at individual patients as your popul as as you know individuals as your patient, but looking at populations and communities as your patients. And um, you know, worked in public health for twenty some years. Uh, first at the Centers for Disease Control, then um, went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, but if you look at public health and if you look at the challenges within public health, a lot of what leads to poor health <laughs> are not just health factors. Uh, and in my years of working in HIV and AIDS, which I worked in for many years when I was at CDC, you know, the factors that lead to the spread of HIV um, you know, it, yes, it's a virus, but it's also poverty. It's, it's inequity. It's, uh, you know, um, discrimination and, and so many of those sort of things that are not just di directly impacted by health and health interventions, but are the very sort of things that we work on care. It's the underlying causes. It's poverty. It's inequity. 
it's discrimination, stigma, et cetera. So for me, it was kind of really working, coming full circle, working on health issues, but looking constantly at what are the underlying causes of poor health and, and um, unequal distribution of disease and death around the world. And that kind of led me to um, my work at CARE. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd first like to thank all of you for some really excellent questions. Uh, we would love to continue the conversation in our great hall just outside of the auditorium. We have a reception, and I hope you will join us and stay for that. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, Sharon Massini and Marina Whitman, for hosting the conversation. And then a very special thank you on behalf of the Ford School. Please join me in thanking Dr. Gale. <laughs>